I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 18 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Ayres proposing a matter of public importance was chosen. It is shown at item 12 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? It is supported. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers for today's discussion. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clocks accordingly. And I call Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I welcome the opportunity to speak on this important MPI today, for a, there isn't a more important issue at the moment um, that uh, affects all of Australia but the opening up safely uh, from the COVID-19 lockdowns that have particularly plagued uh, the eastern, uh, southeastern parts of Australia since uh, June and July this year. Uh, we raise this matter of public importance. Senator Ayres has raised it because we are worried uh, that as the opening up is happening, the government is being less than transparent with the information it has available to them about what will happen as part of the opening up, how many cases of COVID-19 will occur in the community, how many of those will be serious, how many of those will end up in hospital, and indeed what is the capacity or the preparedness of the hospital system uh, to deal uh, with those cases. And I've been following this pretty closely on a number of, for a number of reasons. One is the chair of the Select Committee on COVID-19, so we have been following the reluctance of the Morrison government to make information available in, in as early a time as possible to keep Australians' trust and, and, to let, and to thank them for the sacrifices they've been making over the last 20 months as we've all stayed home and we've all um, haven't seen family and we haven't gone to um, social occasions and we haven't celebrated birthdays and we've been apart from our loved ones when they've passed away and we haven't been able to attend funerals and travel. And all of those things don't sound that much, but they have taken their toll on everybody. And part of the trust engagement between a government and their citizens, particularly in times like this where we are subjecting ourselves voluntarily to some really harsh restrictions on the way that we would normally live our lives, is that that trust is repaid by the provision of information about why you're doing it and what happens when those restrictions change. So the Australian community has played their part in this bargain. We have done what was asked of us and we are happy and we want the opening up to happen and we want it to happen safely. Um, but the other side of the deal is that we should be advised about what that means. We have stayed home to make sure our hospital system was there to care for people, not just with COVID, but with other conditions who required uh, hospital resources, and we have done it willingly for the greater good. Um, and that's been, you know, a really tremendous, I think, um, you know, sign of the sort of collective nature of we're all in this together. But the reason we had the lockdown was to make sure those resources were available to care for those that needed it. That, that is still the same as we open up. You know, as we open up and we get more cases and the virus gets transmitted, what is the preparedness of the healthcare system to deal with that? Now we know the government has that information. <laughs> We know that the Department of Health was commissioned pretty late in the piece, if you ask me, in August to go around and have a look at how the hospitals uh, were prepared for the opening up as part of the national plan. I was surprised it was that late, but they, uh, I read about it in the paper. I heard the health minister say that this work had been commissioned and that the Commonwealth was engaging with the states and territories about what that looked like. We know that they have had that document that uh, we know that Professor Brendan Murphy has briefed National Cabinet on it. Uh, we know that they know exactly what the health care system will look like, I'm sure, under various scenarios. But do we know? No, because that information is not being shared. 
Now, there may be a reason for this, but I'm suspicious because really the only reason we've been given when we've sought other information is, well, it's cabinet in confidence and you can't have it. But surely on a matter like this, where we have made so many sacrifices, we should be given the information about what our hospital system is looking like now and what it will look like as we uh, um, come out of the lockdown. And that means what it looks like in Sydney and Melbourne and Perth and Queensland and regional and rural hospitals, remote locations. We heard at the Senate committee last week that there are some places in Australia where vaccination rates remain extremely low, sometimes anywhere from 25 to 30 per cent below uh, the national average in some communities, particularly First Nations communities. And we don't have any idea what the allocation of resources is going to be for them in those communities or in hospitals. We know the AMA is worried. They've released a report really concerned. They've appeared before the committee really concerned about what this means. It's their members that work in the hospitals. They are seeing firsthand what is happening in those hospitals. And we know right now, even in the non-COVID states, hospitals are pushed to their limits. We know in the COVID states and territories, we know the hospitals are operating at their limits. This is a busy time of year for any hospital every, any year, let alone when you've got a global pandemic that you're managing as well. We know the states and territories are worried because they've tried to engage the Commonwealth on this. What, how are we going to meet this demand? We know the AMA is calling for extra help in, to, in the community. I mean, most people with COVID are going to be looked after at home. I've just been through that. I know what it means. It's hard work. People are sick. Don't trivialise the virus. Don't say, oh, it's like nothing. You know, it's nothing. It's a little virus. Most people get mild symptoms. People are running mini home hospitals in their home, often with very little support. I have just been there. I have done it. It's hard. And in, unless you can engage your GP and have a GP come and, and, and you have a fabulous GP like mine, who actually helped me twice a day, every day for 14 days as I got my family members through the worst of that virus, you are largely on your own. So what is happening in the community? What is going to happen for primary health care? The Commonwealth is responsible for it. Are they doing anything? Are they supporting GPs? Well, we heard the AMA in evidence before my committee say, well, they haven't spoken to us about it and we would like them to. And this was only a month ago, 20 months into the pandemic, and we don't have a plan for primary health care provision around COVID-19. And yet the Prime Minister tells us it's all fine to open up. Well, if it's all fine to open up, tell us what it's going to look like. How many people are going to be operating mini home hospitals, isolated and doing it on their own, looking after sick people? It is not normal for people, young, otherwise healthy people, to die in their homes. That has been happening in New South Wales. Now, I'm not trying to scaremonger here. I'm just saying what is happening. We do not live in a country where we can have 30 to 40 people, otherwise healthy, die at home. We have had 500 Australians die in this third wave of the outbreak. You know, and people might try and write that off and say, well, it's good, look overseas. But that's irrelevant. Look at our experience and look what it means as we open up. Everyone tells us there will be more cases. It will rip through the schools and the, and the places where we have large gatherings. And it's great that we are vaccinated to the levels we are. It's absolutely fantastic. It will provide protection. But our hospitals are under enormous pressure. And why is it that we are not being told what that means? We are not used to, in this country, having health care rationed or not having health care available if we need it. And, you know, and I hope the Commonwealth has a plan to make sure that doesn't happen. But I'm not given the confidence that I need with the knowledge that I have and the experience that I've just come through, when the Commonwealth hides this information, they will not tell us what the hospitals will look like. They will not tell us what they're doing 
and will do to keep people safe. They're not telling us how they're going to keep health services going. We know people are not accessing health services as they normally would. We know cancer diagnoses are down, screening programs are down, all explainable in a global pandemic sense. But what is going to happen? What is the national plan on this? And why is the Prime Minister hiding this information? Because it does make one believe that the only reason he's hiding this information and not providing it is because he doesn't want people to know. You know and that's an, an even more serious delegation of responsibility. And we're used to that, in a sense. But honestly, it's the least this Prime Minister can do to pay back the work that we have all done. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Molan. <coughs> Acting Deputy President, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I have to admit that I did find the MPI in its written form somewhat confusing. And, and uh, Senator Gallagher has now clarified it a little bit. I thought that it had something to do with the Doherty, Doherty modelling. The Doherty modelling lies at the centre of everything that we're doing. Uh, but uh, I think I may have missed any reference that you may have made to that. Um, I, I, we, we are in a process of opening up safe, safely, uh, and uh, I, I don't accept that we are uh, less than transparent in what we're doing. Uh, we've all made sacrifices. Uh, Senator Gallagher has, it has taken a personal toll on her, and we're aware of that, and I'm very sensitive to that. Uh, I have been a user of those same hospitals that Senator Gallagher was talking about uh, for other than COVID uses. And, uh, in March of this year, when I started using them, I sent to both Senator Gallagher, who was responsible in her previous iteration, as for the extraordinary cancer setup that we have in, in the ACT, and also to Senator Seselja, as someone who's worked in the AT, ACT. Uh, uh, so the hospitals are in use by others, and there will be a call on them. Uh, there is lots of information being shared. Uh, I don't want to trivialise the virus in any way, shape or form, and I would be terrified to think that I, as a parent, had to nurse any of my children through this period of time. Uh, Senator Gallagher tells us, uh, counsels us to be careful not to scaremonger, uh, and that's very, 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 very important. And that's why information and accurate information is so important. Uh, uh, let's get the facts right and the plans right. Let's not be paranoid about this and uh, let's not push it too hard. Uh, let's get it right before we release the facts. Now, we are in a process of suppressing the virus and delivering the vaccine. If there was something fundamentally wrong with what we're doing, we wouldn't see the results that we are seeing at the moment, which are quite extraordinary. And, and uh, uh, Senator Gallagher mentioned the fact that we are uh, vaccinating people at a quite phenomenal rate. Uh, and Australia's first dose, dose vaccination rate is now higher than the US. It's higher than Germany. It's higher than Israel that we all held up as being the paragon of COVID management and it's higher than the OECD average. So in relation to the written MPI, to think that there is a problem with the Doherty modelling must indicate that some, somewhere the modelling must have got it relatively right. Uh, more than 95 per cent of over 70s are protected with the first dose, do, with the first dose and more than 85 per cent uh, have received a second dose, and 65 per cent plus of the eligible population aged 16 and over are fully vaccinated. And I think that's about, it's, it's well into 68 per cent at the moment. So there is a plan, and that plan is very, very important, and it's being run. And basic to that plan is the modelling. Uh, the modelling must be good. Uh, it's, it's certainly better than a lot of the climate change alarmist modelling that has failed in the recent past. On both the health and economic fronts, Australia has fared better than most countries in dealing with COVID-19. For example, over 12 per cent of people in the USA—12 per cent and 11 per cent of people in the UK have had COVID. By contrast, 0.4 per cent of Australians have had COVID. And that's not to trivialise it. It is to acknowledge that someone somewhere must be doing something right. Of the 38 developed OECD countries, 
Australia has had the second lowest number of COVID-19 cases per capita. The second lowest number of COVID-19 cases per capita. And as on a per capita basis, the UK and the USA have had over 40 times the number of COVID deaths. Now, we say, uh, with, with, with validity, we say that if Australia had have had the death rates of OECD countries, uh, we would have had something in the order of 30,000 people who have died. Uh, and how can you criticise the modelling which lies at the centre of the plan if, in fact, we are achieving such, such success? While Australia has been doing it tough, and we know we've been doing it tough, we are all making the sacrifice in relation to that, and I acknowledge that Senator Gallagher has made a particular sacrifice through her family, uh, Australia's economy and, the, uh, and its GDP recovered to be larger than prior to the pandemic. Now, that's extraordinary, ahead of any advanced major economy in the world. Uh, now, Australia was also the first advanced economy to have more people in work uh, than they had prior to COVID. Nearly 900,000 jobs have been created since May last year. Uh, and uh, our credit rating agencies and the IMF have acknowledged this very, very important fact, because the sacrifices that we are all making are reflected in an incredible degree to, in, the, in the economy of the nation. Now, turning to the written form of the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the matter of public importance, uh, I need to talk a little bit about the Doherty modelling. Uh, in July of 2021, the Prime Minister announced an agreement to formulate a four-step national plan to transition Australia's national COVID response. Senator Gallagher asked if there was a plan. There is a plan, and we are seeing that plan on a daily basis. Now, to support the plan, because facts are important, to support the plan, the Doherty Institute was commissioned to undertake modelling of COVID-19 infections and vaccinations to define target levels for transition to phase B and phase C of the four-step plan. Based on the results of the modelling and the recommendations of the COVID-19 Risk Analysis and Response Task Force, in July again, of 2021, National Cabinet agreed to transition to phases B and C at 70 per cent and 80 per cent, respectively, of those, uh, of those vaccinated 16 years and older. Because jurisdictions are likely to have uh, different cases, uh, uh, different case counts, different numbers of COVID, when vaccination thresholds are met, a sensitivity analysis was conducted. And this is part of the modelling process that was mentioned in the written version of the matter of public importance. This assessed the initial modelling results for low, medium and high numbers infections at different coverage thresholds with either optimal or partial test, trace, isolate, quarantine, TTIQ, as they say in the, in, in the profession, and combinations of public health and social, social measures, PHSM, God help us all. But this is what the MPI refers to when it, when it refers to, I think, a small COVID outbreak. Well, that has been the sensitivity towards various, uh, various levels of outbreak have certainly been conducted and the sensitivity analysis was conducted. The overall conclusions of the initial modelling were found to remain valid even with a higher number of infections. Uh, and this is very, very relevant to the MPI. To, uh, uh, valid even with a higher number of infections at the time of transition. However, at 70 per cent coverage with medium or high seeding and partial TTIQ, the epidemic curve was shifted to, shift to the left and the peak of daily new infections considerably higher. We know that. As optimal TTIQ, a test, trace, isolate and quarantine, cannot be sustained at higher caseloads, public health and social measures are required in those situations. So by knowing the facts, by doing the modelling, by looking at the sensitivity for various scenarios, uh, we can vary the TTIQ and the PHSM. The sensitivity analysis, of course, has been published on the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet website and the Doherty Institute site. Now, this has cost us roughly one and a half million as of December 2021, and an additional contract is currently being finalised for additional work 
uh, for the national national cabinet. So we do have a plan, and that plan is in in is is in play and is being used and is success is successful. Uh, uh, certainly. Aspects of modelling have been released, particularly the sensitivity aspects of the modelling. Now, further modelling is anticipated to consider the public health response, including different methodologies and key indicators for the TTIQ, the impact of vaccinations and responses in key populations, including, including Indigenous communities, culturally and linguistically diverse populations, and schools, and border measures and quarantine and how varying these may affect the risk of importation is being considered in great detail. Now, I think that that answers the ideas that lie in the written version of the, M of the Order, matter of public Senator importance. Mullen. Senator Steele John, remotely. Thank you, uh, Chair. You know what? I, I, I've, got to, I've got to pause at the beginning of this contribution to, to thank my fabulous new uh, team member, Joanna Partiger, for pulling together some notes for me to contribute to this uh, MPI debate this afternoon, because to be honest with you, if I'm left to my own devices with this particular topic, I am rendered almost mute by the deep frustration and anger that wells up inside me. Whenever we talk about what has happened in this country since the coming of the pandemic and the role of this government in mismanaging it, I just, it is almost beyond words. And our community is so frustrated by the endless marketing spin that spews from the mouths of these ministers every time we talk about this topic. The reality of COVID-19 and the Morrison government's management of the pandemic is a reality of failure and double standard. It would be bad enough if disabled people had been left out of the uh, pandemic plan, actively deprioritised. It would be bad enough had the health minister failed to order the vaccine when he could have and should have. It would have been bad enough if the National Cabinet had not been allowed to devolve into a squabbling rabble of politicians all trying to balance their public duties with the demands of their donors who want to get back to business as usual because it's how they make money. It would have been bad enough had millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars been funneled out of the public door into the pocket of people like Jerry Harvey through the job uh, keeper scheme. Those things alone would have been enough to condemn this government in history as the woeful manager of this great crisis that it is. But they have not stopped there. They have added to this mountain of failure by failing our kids and leaving them exposed right at the moment when we are changing the way that we manage COVID-19 in the two biggest states. The expert health panel of SAGE has been calling on the government for weeks to fit air filtration and air monitoring systems in public schools, schools across the country, just like the filters that they have recently fit in the New South Wales Parliament. And yet the response of the state government, the response of the federal government is to say no, yet another failure, putting Australians at risk. Thank you, Senator Steelejohn. Senator McCarthy, also remotely. Madam Acting Deputy President, I've just travelled over 3,000 kilometres across the Northern Territory, talking to families, listening to their concerns, talking to clinicians uh, in many of our remote clinics. And I want to be able to uh, share with the Senate uh, what has happened and what has occurred on those travels. But firstly, after listening to Senator Gallagher speak this afternoon, and also knowing personally the impact that COVID has had on her family, it is of utmost urgency that this Senate recognises this call for the MPI in terms of the Doherty modelling around hospitals and their capability to cope with the days 
weeks and months ahead. Uh, I'm certainly very concerned in terms of the people of the Northern Territory, in particular our First Nations people. The Morrison-Joyce government is not being transparent, Madam Acting Deputy President, with Australians about how the nation's hospital systems will cope with COVID-19 cases when Australia opens up. We know that the Doherty modelling was released outlining how Australia would respond to small COVID outbreaks, but this previous modelling does not adequately deal with how many hospitalisations, deaths and cases are now expected. We know that revised modelling was provided to National Cabinet last month dealing with the preparedness of the hospital system to cope with an influx of COVID-19 hospitalisations when the nation reopens. Now, Senator Gallagher asked for this information to be released in her capacity as chair of the COVID-19 Select Committee, and it was refused. The broader Australian community, and particularly our hardworking doctors and nurses who will be on the front line continuously of this additional pressure deserve to know what they need to prepare for because many states and territories fear their hospital systems will not cope. And I'm sure I do not need to remind the Senate of the vulnerability, in particular here in the Northern Territory, when the Delta strain reaches us. It is a matter of when, not if, the Delta strain will arrive here. The Northern Territory Government the Aboriginal community controlled health sector, land councils, frontline workers and others have done a terrific job keeping Territorians safe during this pandemic so far. And we have seen incredibly strong leadership. But we also know Australia is opening up and we can't keep Delta at bay forever. As I said, I spent the last few weeks travelling across the Northern Territory, over 3,000 kilometres down the Western Desert, the Tanami region, through places like Kalgarinji, Lajamanu, Yundamu, through Alice Springs over the other side on the east to Santa Teresa, and back again to Hermansburg, and then up the track to Alikaran, to Tennant Creek, to Elliot, to Catherine. It was so important to be able to see firsthand how prepared are we here in the Northern Territory. In each place I've been talking and listening to constituents and organisations about COVID-19 and the need to actually to vaccinate against it. And that message is going around loud and clear. But we are having issues. Every clinic I dropped into is doing their best to get the message out and vaccinate. Anangi Health Aboriginal Corporation in Tennant Creek, run by General Manager Barb Shaw, is doing a terrific job through public health campaigning but they're facing incredible challenges. Ananingi is the Aboriginal healthcare provider for Tennant Creek, as well as neighbouring town camps and near, nearby communities. They've been setting up pop-up clinics in town, running massive public health campaigns, door knocking as everywhere they can, and heading out to surrounding communities to provide public health messaging, and then returning a week later with a vaccination team. So that's the preparatory work that they're trying to do in languages that the people of that region can understand because English is not always the first language. This is all ramping up now as the blitz, as they blitz the Barclay region. So Madam Acting Deputy President, with Tennant Creek being a town located on the Stewart Highway, there's no way they'll be able to shut down that area when Delta comes. It is on a major highway and services surrounding communities. They do have a hospital but like so many, uh, they are worried about its capacity. The Tennant Creek Hospital. If an outbreak occurs, what will this mean for their population and the surrounding communities? Tennant Creek has a population which is majority First Nations people, and that means they were supposed to be vaccinated in the 1B Morrison government phase, a priority group that should have been vaccinated by now. Here we are in October 2021. Remember in December last year, when Scott Morrison stood up and assured the nation that vulnerable Australians like those with disabilities, older Australians and Indigenous Australians will be prioritised with the vaccine? Well, hello, empty rhetoric, let me tell you. Phase 1B is still not done. Despite the hard work of our Aboriginal community controlled health sector, 
vaccine rates in the Barclay remain low. Instead, changing advice around AstraZeneca, lack of Pfizer supply recommended for the NT's younger population and a failed communication strategy has ensured the Morrison-Joyce government has failed to reach the Territorians. It's only last month, Madam Acting Deputy President, that Minister Ken Wyatt finally succumbed to pressure from Labor and announced $250,000 funding for First Nations Media Australia to produce and distribute culturally appropriate messaging on the vaccine rollout. That was in September. We talked about it in February this year. There were questions I put to the Federal Health Department about what was the language uh, that they were going to use, or the languages. We have over 100 Aboriginal languages here. What was the funding that they were going to pro pro provide so these communities would prepare? That has now come in September. I asked it back in February. Health workers are on the back foot trying to ensure accurate and factual messages reaches their patients about the vaccine, and it's all left a vacuum the negative messaging to take deep hold in the minds of many. What was equally disturbing is the answers to my question to most clinicians in the communities visited. In a worst case scenario, how prepared is this community to cope with a COVID outbreak? The overwhelmed and exhausted faces said it all. So I asked the Morrison government to think of those overwhelmed and exhausted faces. Listen to Senator Gallagher and Labor Listen to the Australian Medical Association. Release this modelling. Even Department of Health Secretary Brendan Murphy, who has been working with Deputy Chief Medical Officer Sonia Bennett on the modelling, supports the figures about hospital capacity being made public. And I quote, I would favour a transparent approach, but that is up to National Cabinet, he said. Ask any doctor, any nurse, we know that pressure on our hospitals is going to increase over the coming weeks and months. But Scott Morrison won't reveal the modelling that he commissioned about what pressure would actually really look like on our hospital system. He's keeping secret the modelling that he commissioned with taxpayer dollars from the Australian community and importantly, Australia's hardworking doctors and nurses and all those on the front line. We all deserve to know now what that pressure will look like so we can prepare. And we deserve a Prime Minister who will sit down and maturely discuss with the state and territory governments to make sure there's a plan to keep hospitals safe and strong, rather than just picking political fights with them. And that means all hospitals in regional and remote Australia. And let me tell you, it means our hospitals here in the Northern Territory, our Alice Springs Hospital, Tennant Creek Hospital, Nullanboy Hospital, Catherine Hospital and our city hospitals in Darwin and in Palmerston. We do not have time to waste. We must be prepared and that is what leadership is. Instead, we have a Prime Minister who refuses to take responsibility. For Scott Morrison, every problem is someone else's fault. Every crisis is someone else's responsibility. When he's called out on his failures, Scott Morrison's response is always the same. It's not my job. It's a matter for the states. I don't hold a hose. Whether it's COVID, bushfires, robo-debt, aged care, car park rorts or climate change, he never shows leadership, just more spin. But Australians deserve so much more than this and the people of the Northern Territory deserve so much more than this. Our health workers deserve much more than this. They are exhausted and they are anxious. Come on, Prime Minister, give us the modelling. Let us prepare to fight this. Order, Senator McCarthy. Senator Bragg. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. And uh, it's a pleasure to be able to rise and to make some comments about uh, this particular matter of public importance. Maybe better if uh, the microphone wasn't on, but given that it is, I'll, I'll be. Uh, I'll be forced to proceed, I guess. Well, with, look, without um, questioning the sincerity of any of the prior contributors, uh, I will try and make this statement free of any political talking points, uh, because I think people are over uh, the bickering. I think people are over 
uh, politicians whinging about other politicians. Um, and I think when you look at this period uh, in a few years, maybe even in a few months, um, there's my Apple Watch doing something it shouldn't be doing, sorry about that. Um, I think people will, will look at the comparative data and they'll say, well, Australia uh, went into the pandemic and came out with a pretty low death rate, uh, pretty low infection rate compared to other jurisdictions, and the economic disruption was minimised through a huge stimulus program. Um, and because of that huge fiscal stimulus program, uh, there wasn't enormous sustained loss of employment. So I think on those key metrics, uh, people will say that Australia tracked fairly well through the pandemic. I think they'll say that the innovation of the National Cabinet was largely a success because it enabled there to be discussion, coordination across the Australian government. So I think people have learnt the hard way, if they didn't already know, that uh, Australia's constitution um, does disperse power quite significantly. Um, sometimes that works, other times it doesn't. I think people um, will be rightly frustrated with the restriction on movement. And state premiers and leaders of the states uh, will be accountable to their public that elected them for their their decisions, their decisions, and I don't seek to run a commentary on any of the, the states. I think there's been enough of that, and there have been different approaches used. I think, in terms of my own uh, state that I represent, I think Sydney had, going into the pandemic, some unique characteristics as Australia's global city and as a city that carried 85 or 90 percent of the uh, quarantine, uh, that it was always likely to have the sort of exposure that we saw uh, when the Delta variant slipped into Sydney and then that subsequently spread around the eastern or parts of the eastern states. So I think that's the first point to make, that comparatively I think you'd have to say that our institutions uh, held up pretty well when you look at the key, key metrics. Um, in relation to the, the modelling and the national plan, I mean there is a sensitivity analysis available on, on the website and there are the key assumptions. Uh, and that plan, um, you'd have to say, is working. I mean, in New South Wales, um, consistent with the, the broad outline of the plan, uh, New South Wales has hit 70 per cent and 80 per cent, and it is now reopening. Um, and in fact, uh, you'd have to say, without wanting to date this uh, contribution too significantly, that with the case numbers coming down, it's been, it's been a pretty good example of what, what you would have hoped could be achieved. So people will, will rightly look at the major health initiatives, how the health policies were managed and deployed. People will look at when the books are written, they'll look at hotel quarantine, they'll look at the vaccination rollout, um, and then they will look at the border policies and the, and the like. And people will be free to make their assessments. Um, I, I'm more interested in the economic policy because I think um, that is where, frankly, there have been um, some very um, you know, unusual steps taken, uh, steps that I would support, but I would say that um, the amount of debt that's been accrued um, has been justified in the sense that if that debt hadn't been accrued, then I'm not sure there would have been the sort of bounce back that we would expect. And the Treasury advice generally has been, um, following the early 90s recession, that uh, you do need to spend a lot of money to, av to avoid a lasting recession. Um, and we didn't want to see, as a consequence of this huge economic shock, um, a generation of people unable to work again. And I think that's what JobKeeper has been able to do as a, as a, as a, as a wage subsidy program. Um, and I'd, I'd say that, I will make a political statement here, that. I mean, the Labor Party uh, want to attack JobKeeper, um, but I mean, ultimately, uh, JobKeeper was the lifeline that has kept 
small businesses intact. It is um, the program which I would say most Australians would say got them through the pandemic. Now, there's no question that people who work for the public sector or people who work in big business, in many cases, have probably had quite a good pandemic. Um, if you can walk into your kitchen and stick your laptop down on the bench, you've had a, probably a pretty good pandemic relative to people who uh, are in personal care sectors, their beauticians or their barbers or their travel agents. And, and, and these are the businesses that have really relied upon this sort of support. Um, so when the Labor Party want to attack JobKeeper, um, I, I just think that the people who have most heavily relied upon that scheme um, will think, well, hang on, that, actually, that scheme actually saved my business, it saved my livelihood. Um, it was hugely successful. Um, so, I mean, 99 per cent of the businesses that, that achieved the, the threshold to be eligible for JobKeeper were small businesses. Right? So that is a fact. So um, when, when the opposition parties talk about wanting to have some sort of a clawback mechanism on JobKeeper, well, they, what, what, what they're saying, what they're saying, it's been, it's been flagged by various members of the opposition that there would be a clawback, including, including Ms King, Ms. Ka Ms Carney, right? And you want to have a clawback, right? And you want to have a clawback, right? And that wasn't recommended. And, and there was no clawback recommended. The Treasury never recommended a clawback. And a clawback today would, be, would, would see 99 per cent of the businesses that would be hit would be small businesses. Small businesses, and in my state, these are the same businesses that have been smashed by lockdowns. They've just come out of, just come out of, th out of three months of lockdowns, and the opposition parties want to, want to hit them with a, with a clawback, a retrospective tax. They, 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 they were all eligible, right? So when you want to measure, when you want to measure JobKeeper in terms of the, the businesses that were eligible and, and were paid, uh, in terms of the dollars, and in terms of the, the quantum of businesses, they are small businesses. More than 90 per cent are small businesses. So when you talk about clawback, you're talking about small businesses. Small businesses. So isn't that amazing that you want to have a, a, a debate about the economic policies that got the country through the pandemic, and at the, at the end of it, you want, to, you, want to claw, you want to claw back from small businesses? I think it's, it's bizarre. Now, the, the, other, the other scheme that was also very successful that I know that annoys the Labor Party no end was the early, re early release of super. Very, very successful. Right? Because this was about allowing Australians to have access to their own money in a time of a huge economic shock. Now, uh, interestingly, at the time, uh, the only people that were against giving Australians access to their own money were, of course, the super funds, uh, which Labor went along with. Labor went along with. So you've got the greatest economic shock in 100 years. You're opening the Treasury. You're, using, you're, you're almost maxing out the nation's credit card. But the Labor Party said, oh, no, we're not going to touch the super funds. We're not going to touch the super funds, um, even though they've got $3 trillion right, in, a, in, in a government pension scheme. So I think that was a successful policy. I mean, I would personally like to see some sort of a permanent scheme be put in place so people could access their own money. Because I tell you what, you know, I think that home ownership is pretty important to a lot of people. Uh, and low-income people in particular can't get a first home because they've got to funnel 10 per cent of their money into the super funds. Which of, which of course pays huge donations to the unions, which in turn funds the Labor Party. So you know, I'm sick of coming into this place and hearing all these allegations about, about corruption and donations. The biggest political donors in the country are the unions and the, and the super funds. They funnel tens of millions of dollars each year into the political coffers of those, op of those opposite. It's, it's shameful, Shame. uh, and I really suggest that you think carefully about uh, your long-term policy agenda because it's not really in the interest of workers uh, to have their money sent off to these funds, to have high fees charged on them, and for these funds to basically spend all their money on political advertising uh, with Mr Combe's face on them and running dodgy outfits. Goodbye. Uh, Senator Patrick. Uh, th thank you, Madam Acting De Deputy President. Um, look, I rise to speak on this uh, matter of public importance, and I I'll take a slightly different approach to others. I just want to go to the letter uh, uh, to Senator uh, Gallagher on, um, from Dr Brennan Murphy uh, in 
refusing to provide information to the Senate in relation to this, where, where he writes, the Australian government maintains the views that the deliberations of the National Cabinet should remain confidential. This includes information received by National Cabinet. This is consistent with the long-standing practices of Cabinet confidentiality. Now, that is, uh, that is an offensive uh, comment provided to the Senate by Dr Brennan Murphy, who is trimming his political sails because we know that this matter has been to the AAT before Justice White. We know that National Cabinet is in fact not a, not a co uh, committee of the, of the federal cabinet. Why, why is the government, why is the executive now taking a position where they think that even though a judicial uh, officer, a, a, a uh, justice of the federal court, has made a determination about the statutory meaning of, of a cabinet, that somehow uh, that the, the Prime Minister can simply ignore that. Somehow uh, the Prime Minister uh, arrogantly pursues his quest for secrecy and he ropes in uh, Brendan Murphy, Dr Brendan Murphy. And that's just, and, you know, if uh, uh, Dr Murphy is listening, that is a disgraceful position to take in terms of understanding the way our constitution works, the separation of powers and the roles that, that uh, that um, each of the different uh, uh, elements of our government work, the executive, the parliament and the judiciary. There's been a judicial determination as to what is a committee of the cabinet, and it is not the national cabinet. It doesn't have the necessary characteristics. Firstly, it is not a committee of the federal cabinet because it was established by COAG, not the federal cabinet. Secondly, it doesn't, uh, it, it, its members are not made up of members of the federal cabinet. Its members are actually made up of, uh, of the prime minister and the first ministers across each of the jurisdictions. It doesn't have collective responsibility or cabinet solidarity because it can't, because the premiers <clears throat> of each of the different states and the chief ministers have a legal obligation uh, to have allegiance only to their state. And that was found by Justice, uh, Justice White. <clears throat> and a, a key principle of a cabinet is that it, in a responsible system of government, the cabinet is responsible to a single parliament, not to nine, as is the case with the national cabinet. The national cabinet is a uh, committee of, uh, sorry, is a um, intergovernmental uh, committee. That's all it is. And it is disgraceful that. Uh, the government is still adopting this principle that it is somehow. I mean, they've introduced a bill to try and overturn the judgment, and they can't get the numbers even amongst their own uh, ranks. And you know, uh, uh, the, the, the assistant attorney general is sitting listening to this uh, debate, uh, and ought to be standing up for Justice White and the ruling that he made. It was very, very clear. You've got government members basically saying we ignore what Justice White has said. As the assistant attorney, you ought to be standing up for our judicial officers and making sure that everyone understands the role that each, uh, each of the different parts of our uh, government uh, play. It's, it's a disgrace that this information has not been made public on the basis that it's co uh, cabinet confidential, because it's not. Thank you, Senator Patrick. And I call Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. In Tasmania, the state that I represent, the government has commissioned its own modelling on the impact of COVID-19 once the state opens up. As a result of that, the government, and I might add it's a Liberal government, has made the decision not to fully open up the state until 90 per cent of the eligible population has been vaccinated. That's quite a different plan from the rest of the country and quite a divergence from the national plan. This Tasmanian specific modelling is due to be finalised this week. That really makes me wonder what more the Tasmanian Premier learnt at National Cabinet that made him make this decision. He did reveal the Doherty modelling figures on likely coronavirus deaths if our island reopened at an 80 per cent vaccination rate. Over the first six months, it would result in 14,900 cases up to 590 hospital admissions, 97 intensive care admissions and almost 100 deaths. 
He also made it clear that it was not an acceptable risk to take. Our doctors and nurses and paramedics are telling us loud and clear that moving to the next stage of the National Cabinet Plan will put a huge pressure on hospitals around the country as lockdowns are lifted in New South Wales, Victoria and the ACT, and borders are opened in the COVID-free states like Tasmania. There is revised modelling on the capacity of health systems and hospitals to cope with an influx of COVID-19 hospitalisations as Australia reopens. It models how many cases, hospitalisations and deaths can be expected. And the Morrison government is refusing to release it publicly. Modelling for the whole country that outlines the impacts on our, on our hospitals exists. We paid for it. Our taxes paid for it. But the Prime Minister is keeping those details secret. We have a right to know. Our health, hard-working healthcare workers have a right to know. Our paramedics and nurses, those working shift after shift, seemingly endless hours of overtime, have a right to know, and the Australian people have a right to know. In the last months, we have seen our hospitals, particularly in Sydney and Melbourne, at breaking point. And in Tasmania, even without COVID-19, our hospitals are at breaking point almost every single day. That's right, when the state is COVID-free. And we are starting to see the lag from the last 18 months because people weren't seeking the treatment when they should have. And as COVID does come into Tasmania, that pressure on our health system will increase. It is not acceptable for Mr Morrison to keep this modelling a secret. And it is not acceptable for Mr Morrison simply to pretend that this is all the state's responsibility. He's done that far too often throughout this pandemic with the vaccine rollout, with quarantine, and we could go beyond that with everything else. The culture of avoidance and secrecy that this Liberal government has cultivated has reached extraordinary heights, to the point where we're even here today demanding on behalf of the people that we represent to be allowed to see the revised modelling we have paid for that tells us how or if our hospitals will cope. I have absolute faith in the dedicated health professionals in Tasmania. Daily, they pull out all the stops. They work double shifts and more, tending to Tasmanians with their care and expertise. But even on a good day, our hospital system is crying out for more staff and more resources. We've seen a 30 per cent increase in patients on the elective surgery waiting list and ambulance ramping at unprecedented levels. Years of underfunding and bed blocks have sent it seen it lurch from crisis to crisis. And that has left us in a position where the Premier is not prepared to commit to easing border restrictions until we are 90 per cent vaccinated. That's how worried he is about the pressure that will be brought to bear on our health system. We all deserve to know what that pressure will look like. And then we deserve a Prime Minister who will sit down and maturely constructively work with the state and territory governments to make sure there's a plan to keep our hospitals safe and strong. What a real leader, a real Prime Minister, a Prime Minister who understands his role, would do is to be constructively talking to the states and territories about what they need to cope, not playing spiteful politics and playing favourites. What a le real leader would do is take some responsibility. What a real leader would do is not run and hide, and that is, not, that is what this Prime Minister is doing, running and hiding from crisis to crisis. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. I call Senator Van. Thank you, Madam, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I love MPIs, and especially the ones we get, we get from Labor. They make me laugh. They really do. It's just like being given a Dorothy Dixer. Although with Senator Ayres one today, uh, it took a little bit of deciphering of the English, if you could call it that, before I could actually understand it. But thank you, Senator Ayres, for, for a chance to talk on this. And just so everyone's aware, including Senator Ayres and Senator Urquhart, the Doherty modelling is released. I, I have it here. I will table it if you'd like. It's available on the Doherty Institute's website. It's available on the government website. Uh, the, the one I have is revised 10th of August. I'm not sure if there was another one since then, but. 10th of August uh, seems pretty up to date, and it does talk about the effects on the health um, health system, and it talks about the, when we can open up safely, 
And as we've seen with New South Wales and finally on Thursday in Victoria, we're seeing that vaccines are bringing down cases and are working. The national plan that was brought about on the back of the Doherty modelling is working. And we're seeing that in, in Victoria and New South Wales. You know, in New South Wales, only 273 new cases today. In Victoria, my home state, fingers crossed it is working. It's coming down in 1,749 um, 1, cases today. So what we have seen is the, the lockdowns in Victoria, the longest jurisdiction in the whole world to be locked down. The lockdowns don't work. Vaccines are, and vaccines are being rolled out. And you know, to give the Prime Minister his, his credit, you know, I have his media release here from 21st of February 2021, when he said the Australian government has a comprehensive plan to offer COVID-19 vaccines to all Australians by the end of October 2021. And it looks like we're going to hit that. It looks very much like we're going to hit that date. Now, those officers should be congratulating us, but they're having a whinge about something that, that already exists that they don't know anything about. Their, their states aren't fixing their hospital system. The, uh, the Victorian government produced its own one, the Burnett Institute, and in it they say the significant easing of restrictions at 80 per cent will lead to 63 per cent of simulations exceeding 2,500 hospital beds. Now, Senator, uh, Premier Andrews last year promised us 4,000 beds. Now, even on the back of his own modelling, he has failed to deliver those beds. So if any hospital system is at risk, the Victorian one, by the Premier's own modelling, is, is damned by this. It also says, which I, I found incredibly um, in, um, interesting, it says, high rates of symptomatic testing amongst people who are vaccinated could reduce the impact on the health system. Yet day after day and for you know, the whole 18 months, the Victorian testing system has lagged behind other states. Even just today, and I can just pull out one, and we know that the testing rates in New South Wales have dropped because there are so few cases. But there's 90,000 tests, over 90,000 tests uh, in New South Wales in the last 24 hours, yet only 68,000 in Victoria. Yet we've got five times the, the number of cases or more. So the, those opposite should stop crying out and saying, oh, we, we need more. The states need to be doing more because, guess what? The, the Commonwealth Government has already gone to them and said we will invest $131.4 billion in demand-driven public hospital funding to improve that health outcomes for all Australians. And this is in addition to over $8 billion health investment by the Commonwealth during the COVID-19 response. This government is doing everything it needs to do. And Australians can see that. Australians see every day how well we're responding to, to this uh, pandemic. Some of the lowest deaths in the world, heading towards some of the highest vaccination rates in the world. And yet those opposite want to pick at little things and, and just badly worded uh, MPIs that just waste the Senate's time. Come on, guys. Get with Team Australia. That's what you're here for. Get with Team Australia. We're nearly there. Roll up your sleeves. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Van. I call Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy uh, President. I rise to contribute to this matter of true public urgency. Our people are no strangers to infectious diseases to which we have no immunity. And some of the government senators speaking to this motion do have some nerve. Just yesterday, leaked and secret government documents have shown that our people are being infected with COVID up to three times higher, three times higher Aboriginal people in this country are being infected compared to the rest of the population. Is that continuing genocide that the colonial project had intentions to do 240 years ago? 
Is this the sophistication of genocide today or what? The government provided this data to the advisory group on COVID-19 marked as confidential, not to be further distributed. This is data on black lives in this country that the government are being secretive about. If you're doing such a good job, then why don't you want people, our people in particular, to know that you're making us sicker? You're killing us still. Fifty years ago, when government health services were failing us badly, as usual, we took the driver's seat and set up Aboriginal health services right across this country. Fifty years ago. We did that based on self-determination and free, prior and informed consent and holistic health. Today, our services are the best in the country and government models your services on ours, particularly health, legal aid and childcare. But our services don't get the funding, do they? We're just left uh, at the bottom of the heap to, to scrape up the scraps, as per usual. So again, government is failing us, and Morrison is trying to hide the fact that his failures are putting our people at risk. This government talks big on closing the gap in public, but in private, they know that they are making us sicker. And let's be honest, you don't care. We're bottom of the rung. But love a good dot, Peyton, don't you? Our people are strong and resilient, and when we are free to choose our own, our, our own path, this whole country benefits. Everyone deserves to be treated with equal respect and dignity. And Morrison ignores so many calls from our people. You have to stop the genocide in this country against the first people. Senator Thorpe, I would remind you that you address people from the other place by their correct titles. Now, we are almost at five o'clock. I'm reluctant to move to the first speech early, as I want to give all senators a chance to attend the chamber. So, uh, are we ready to go to documents for just a little while? Okay, we will move to consideration of documents.